Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, ambassadors, Eunice family, Dame Minouche, Shafiq. Thank you all so much for coming to this very, very special occasion. I, I hope that each of you will take not one, but two items that you saw on the way in because they explain why this occasion really is so special to us here at AUC. Uh, where we're welcoming uh, Dame Manoush home, where she started her uh, higher education. So we, we claim you as ours. Um, I know the British ambassador and embassy claim you as the British, and rightfully so. Um, all of your connections to so many in the audience tonight make this uh, really very special. The first thing is this brochure on, the Nadia, Yunus, on Nadia Yunus herself and the uh, lecture series and the prize which the Eunice family and friends and contributors have so uh, generously endowed and uh, thoughtfully and touchingly uh, created as a memorial to her. The book, it is a booklet, is full of quotes and testimonials to her and a listing of the names of, of those who have uh, contributed and continue to contribute to the fund. What a very fitting way to carry on not only her memory but her life's work of uh, service. And then this other smaller card, in case you missed it, is, is, uh, is a kind of business card. It doesn't have my name or anyone's name on it, but it's about AUC. And, and what is the connection here? A number of members of the very generous uh, Eunice family are AUCians, have uh, begun their educations with us or completed, uh, started them and, and continued on their lifelong journeys. Um, we have that connection. But we uh, take pride in being Egypt's global university that um, propels, that looks outward, um, that brings people to this wonderful, exciting, uh, welcoming, warm country from uh, the UK, from the United States, from all over the world. Um, in two weeks from China, 17 uh, presidents of African universities will be coming to us. So we take great pride in that, but that too goes to Nadia Yunus herself. She's a, a great example. She, I wish we could claim her as an alumna. We can't. Um, but she exemplified in her life what we do, and that's on our little card, too. And that is inspiring explorers for lifelong journeys of challenge, discovery, innovation, and service. Hers was a life that represented all those things. It was quite a journey, literally a journey, to so many countries around the world, so many situations, and ultimately, deeply, uh, of service to all of humanity. That's what we are about as a university. That's what she uh, was about as a, a pioneering woman in so many ways. So uh, again, Dame Manoush, welcome back to your home. Uh, Mr. Fouad Yunus is, has the uh, honor of uh, further uh, presenting more about our speaker. And then we have a very special young man who's the prize winner, the Nadia uh, Yunus prize winner, who will uh, also speak. Thank you very much. Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 15th annual Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture. This lecture series that many of you are familiar with is part of the Nadia Yunus Memorial Fund, which our family established with AUC following Nadia's tragic death in Baghdad in 2003 in the bombing of the United Nations headquarters where she was serving as Chief of Staff to Sergio Vera de Mello, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General to Iraq. The fund was established in 2004 to commemorate Nadia's memory, because we believed that something positive had to come out of her death. Her career is an inspiration for generations of young Egyptians and Arab students interested in pursuing a career in international relations and humanitarian affairs. Our aim with the lecture series has been to showcase speakers who can shine a light on important matters of global affairs. 
It is an honor and a great pleasure to welcome Dame Binou Shafi as our guest speaker tonight, a woman whose career trajectory resembles my sister Nadia's in many ways, not necessarily in the same fields, but in their shared values, their courage, and their determination to show the world what an Egyptian woman is capable of achieving once she puts her mind to it. <clears throat> the Eunice family is delighted that she will deliver the speech this evening, and we look forward to hearing about her career and insights on the global economy. Dame Minouche is currently director of the London School of Economics and Political Science and served as the deputy governor of the Bank of England and deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. You will find a detailed biography on Minouche in your brochures. For our regular guests, you may notice that the brochure has been <clears throat> given a makeover. This new look and feel has been created to more closely match the website that we set up a few years ago. And we thank the AUC Communications Department for their work on this. I would like to talk briefly about how we envisage the way forward for this lecture series. To date, we have been fortunate to have a very distinguished roster of speakers, including our inaugural speaker, Kofi Annan, Dr. Bernard Kushner, Amri Musa, Dr. Nabil Al Arabi, who is with us here tonight, Dr. Nabil Fahmi, and Lobna Alayan, to name just a few. The lecture series underlying goal is to provide a platform for looking at prescriptive ideas to problems facing Egypt and the region. We are interested in presenting practical solutions to real world problems. And we are hopeful that going forward, our guest speakers will continue to reflect this aim. Today, acting as a moderator or interviewer, we are very happy to welcome Ambassador Karim Wisa. Karim and Minouche are old friends and attended Oxford University together. He was also a good friend of Nadja's from their days at the UN in New York. I wish to thank President Ricciardoni, his staff, and the faculty and students of AUC. A particular mention goes to those students who are active in the Model United Nations program, who we hope benefit from the use of the Nadia Yunus Conference Room on the new campus for their meetings. In closing, I wish to thank all the donors who made this fund possible. We were lucky to receive many generous contributions when we set up the fund from friends and relatives, both near and far. However, in order for the lecture series to grow and improve, we need your continuous support. I kindly urge you all to consider fresh or additional contributions, however modest or large. They will all be gratefully appreciated. Thank you very much. Good evening, your, your Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mazhar Ibrahim. I graduated from the School of Science and Engineering in 2018 with a major in Computer Engineering. I'm also the current recipient of the Nadia Yunus Award for Public and Humanitarian Services. Please allow me to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dan Minou Shafi. Dan Minou Shafi is a leading economist whose career has studied public policy and academia. She was appointed director of the London School 
of Economics and Political Science as of 1st of September 2017. She trained as an economist studying at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, the LSE, and the University of Oxford. And by the age of 36, she had become the youngest ever vice president of the World Bank. She later served as the permanent secretary of the Permanent Department for International Development from 2008 to 2011. Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund and as the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England from 2014 to 2017, where she was responsible for a balance sheet of over 500 billion sterling pounds. She is interested in the future of work and skills, changing attitudes to the social contract, global governance reform, and international economic policy and development. After Dan Minush talks, talks to us about her journey and her rich career path, there will be an open discussion on the topic of tonight's lecture, Global Leadership in a Changing World, between Dan Minush and Ambassador Karim Wisa, who is also an AC alumni, and is currently senior consultant at Jed Lurette Noel. Please welcome on stage, Dan Minush Shafi. Good evening. It is an honor this evening to be giving the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture, and I wanted to thank the Yunus family for inviting me and for all of their hospitality during this visit. I didn't know Nadia Yunus, but I'm sure that if I did, we would have gotten on famously. She, like me, was an Egyptian woman who made a career in international organizations. And like me, she liked to take risks and be where the action was. Sadly, one of those risks took her away from us too soon, and it is why we are here on this occasion to remember her life and celebrate her contributions. It's also a pleasure for me to be here in Ewart Hall at the American University in Cairo, a beautiful space I never imagined I would be speaking at when I was a student here 40, 40 years ago. <laughs> Now, there's a family legend that my great-grandmother's family owned the land that Ewart Hall is sitting on, and they sold it to pay for her wedding dress, <laughs> the tale of which is framed in my aunt's living room. And it's hard to argue that the wedding dress was such a good investment, <laughs> but I'm glad that AUC has benefited and thrived to celebrate its 100th birthday. Now, I've been asked to speak about leadership in a global world and to reflect on my career. And in doing so, I found myself thinking about the role of luck versus effort in one's success and the lessons I've learned from working with different leaders around the world. And those will be my themes for tonight. So let me start on the theme of luck versus effort. How much of one's success is a result of luck, the genetic roll of the dice, the family that you're born into, the country or city in which you live, the schools in your neighborhood, or the teachers that you happen to get? And how much of success is the result of hard work, making good choices, investing for the future? I think the answers to these questions vary enormously over time and place and matter hugely for individuals. But they're also huge public policy questions because so much of what government is supposed to do is to help those who've been unlucky in life to have a fair chance. The philosopher John Rawls, in his famous book, A Theory of Justice, argued that to create a just society, you had to put yourself behind a veil of ignorance and not knowing where you would end up in that society, at the top or at the bottom. And you would then create a set of rules and institutions and policies that would seem fair whether you were going to be rich or poor in that country. And I would call those rules and institutions the social contract. And by social contract, I mean the rights and obligations of citizenship, the payment of taxes in exchange for public goods, 
the way that societies look after the old and the young and the infirm and those who've fallen on hard times, and the promise that society gives of social mobility to those who work hard. And every country relies on four institutions to deliver that social contract, the family, the community and voluntary organizations, the state, and the market. Now, the term social contract may seem very abstract. So let me start by giving you a personal perspective on how the social contract worked in my own experience to illustrate the wider point that I'm trying to make. So let me start with education. My father lost a great deal during the nationalizations in Egypt in the 1960s, and it's a familiar story to many, to many Egyptians. He started again from scratch in a new country with a young family that he had to support. But he had one thing, an education, which enabled him to rebuild his life. When I was growing up, he would always say to us, they can take everything away from you except your education. And so he placed huge emphasis on us working hard and taking our education very seriously. We didn't have the means to choose which schools that I would go to. And so I went to nine or 10 different schools in the United States, state schools, disrupted frequently by desegregation in the American South, which meant that we were often bused to different schools as they were trying to reach, achieve a racial balance. I did not go to great schools, but I did have some great teachers who had a big impact on me. And when I went to university, I was able to upgrade my education over time. We were immigrants when we went to the US, and no doubt my family faced discrimination. But we were also allowed to get on and take advantage of the opportunities that there were. So let me turn to the theme of opportunity and social mobility. When I was growing up, we would often visit my mother's family's village in al Ubeya, where I would see little girls my age, look just like me, who would be working in the fields, not able to go to school, not able to choose who they'd marry, how many children they'd have, or whether they would work. And to this day, I think that could have been me, had I not been born into the family that I was born into, and not been lucky enough to have opportunities that came later in life. And I need to acknowledge my family in that context, my mother Mesa, my sister Nazli, my, my uncle Raouf, my aunt Zizi, my cousins, who are all here. I strongly believe that talent is spread evenly around the world, but opportunity is not, which is why I spent so much of my career in fields like international development and education, which are about spreading opportunity to others. But after that relatively good start, I was able to advance my career in organizations that made decisions on the basis of merit. The World Bank, the IMF, and the civil service, where I spent seven happy years coming in as a complete outsider and rising to the top as a permanent secretary. I remember my grandfather being very puzzled when I didn't want any family help in getting my first jobs. Instead, I went knocking door to door with my very primitive CV, but with much enthusiasm and determination. And I was fortunate that I found organizations in which WASTA, connections, was not the key to advancement. I've also had some very good bosses who gave me the opportunity to grow. And for me, that combination of climbing the ladder of educational quality and meritocratic organizations enabled social mobility, despite the setback that my family had as a result of the nationalizations. And of course, I worked hard, but so did many other people. And now as a citizen, I pay lots of tax for public goods. It supports those less fortunate. It invests in the next generation. It takes care of the older generation who built all the physical and social capital that makes me productive today. Now, I'm sure all of us could tell such a story of how the social contract has worked in our lives. And I'm sure that by virtue of being in this room, many of us have had a lot of luck that got us here. So let me turn to the theme of luck versus effort in Egypt. Ultimately, it is the job of the state, through the social contract, to try and compensate, at least in part, 
for the impact of luck on life chances. So what's happened in Egypt? Now, contrary to popular perception, inequality in Egypt is actually quite low by international standards, in part because states in the Middle East have tended to be highly redistributive. And the introduction of the cash transfer schemes in Egypt recently, takaful and karama, have been hugely important for making sure that between one and a half and two million families, the poorest families in Egypt, have a minimum income that enables them to spend on things like education and more nutritious food. But while the gap between rich and poor in Egypt has actually shrunk, the middle class has done relatively worse. And this hollowing out of the middle class has been driven by cuts in subsidies, declining public sector employment, and low returns to higher education. In the past, the middle class could count on a conveyor belt of higher education leading to university, leading to public sector employment. But now that conveyor belt has stopped. And factors like parental wealth, the quality of your education, and access to advantageous social networks have become much more important for success. And public sector jobs have been contracting and private sector jobs haven't taken their place and filled the gap. And as a result, we have very high unemployment rates. And while many public services remain nominally free, like health and education, the quality of those services has deteriorated markedly. So young people now who have more years of education than their parents did and therefore expected to have a higher standard of living are understandably disappointed. And in the last decade, the percentage of downwardly mobile Egyptians has actually exceeded the number of upwardly mobile Egyptians, what someone called the nouveau poor. In my framework, luck has become more important than effort in driving success, and the prospects of social mobility has actually fallen. And I believe that's a huge driver of the observed decline in life satisfaction that we see in many polls in Egypt. Now let me turn now to my second theme, which is leadership and the lessons I have learned. I always like to start by making a distinction between management and leadership. So management is the normal business of allocating resources, analyzing data, managing people and their performance, making organizational decisions based on well-established processes. Leadership is what you do when you cannot rely on management when you face uncertainty, when you have conflicting and unclear information, and you face many risks? How do you get people to follow you when the destination is unclear? So what does good leadership look like? I think leadership exists at many levels and can take many forms. I often give the example of my grandmother, the daughter of the one with the wedding dress. She was number 15 of 17 children, and she was definitely the leader of her clan. She was incredibly tolerant and supportive and let everyone get on with being the best version of themselves. But if anyone did anything that threatened the common good, you would be summoned to her room for a conversation. She never humiliated anyone in public, and conversations over family meals had to be constructive and positive Otherwise, you would get a stern stare from the head of the table. And she always supported the most needy and vulnerable in the family. And as a result, she had huge moral authority and was a very effective leader. Another wonderful example is Nelson Mandela, who is, of course, famous for rising above the anger he must have felt for unjustly serving 27 years in prison. But I especially like his view that good leaders know when they can lead from behind and let others lead, when they need to lead from the middle and be part of the team, and when they need to lead from the front and take people to somewhere they might not want to go, like forgiving white South Africans for decades of racial discrimination. This approach to leadership is especially relevant in universities, where there's an egalitarian culture, power is distributed, and fostering creativity is especially important. Finally, all the great leaders that I've worked with build great teams around them. 
I definitely don't need to be the smartest person in the room, and it's much more fun to have people who are more clever than me on my team. And I also want people who are different than me and who think differently than me. Leaders who live in echo chambers, surrounded by people trying to anticipate their views, invariably make mistakes. I remember sitting around a table with Christine Lagarde at the IMF during the height of the Eurozone crisis, when we really thought the world economy was going to collapse, with some of the best economists in the world arguing about what we should do. And like my grandmother, Christine listened to everyone's perspectives around the table. She had done her homework. She asked some probing questions and then calmly decided what we should do. And because everyone had had a chance to express their views in a constructive way, they walked out of that room as a united team. It reminds me of the fifth century Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who said, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. Not so good when people obey and acclaim him. Even worse when they despise him. But of a good leader who talks little, when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. So what conclusions do I leave you with? First, that success in life is a result of combina a combination of luck and effort. And as I tell my children incessantly, if you got lucky in the lottery of life, you need to do something for those who are unlucky. That can be at an individual level, through charity, through paying taxes. Social mobility is what gives people, so social mobility is what gives people, especially young people, hope. And in most societies, social mobility has declined in recent decades. And I think much of the current malaise we see in countries like Egypt, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, is because of that. Spreading opportunity through education throughout life, fairer job opportunities, and more real competition is probably the biggest social challenge that we face. But addressing it is also vital for our economic success, since getting the most out of our talent is the path to greater prosperity. Finally, I think the model of successful leadership has changed. In the past, we tended to think of a great leader as an authoritarian and authoritative man telling people what to do. That may have been appropriate at a time of mass production and a more deferential age. But today, we live in a much more digital and democratic era. And great leaders inspire, encourage, enable, and build great leaders around them. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I would like to thank uh, Minouche for a very inspirational speech this afternoon. Um, I see a few students in the audience, many colleagues and friends. If I may abuse of my um, position as a moderator, allow me to ask you a, a few questions before we uh, open the floor to, um, to the audience. You've touched on several um, important subjects uh, this afternoon, mainly social mobility. What can be done to restore social mobility uh, in a society like Egypt or, generally speaking, in the emerging, emerging world? I think a lot of the recent research shows that the most critical time are actually the first thousand days of a child's life and making sure that at the very be from the very beginning of life, children have adequate access to nutrition and some stimulation is incredibly important. So you have to start very early. But obviously, high quality education throughout life is essential. And I think uh, more exposure to opportunities 
very early in life. I'll give you a very good example. There's a very nice piece of research that's been done in the United States, and it shows that they look at what, how many people invent new things through patent data, how many people get patents. And they find that if you're a child born into a wealthy family, you're 10 times more likely to get patents than you're if you're a child born into a poor family. If you're a child who happens to be born in Silicon Valley, you are 10 times more likely to produce a technology patent. Whereas if you're a child born in Minnesota, which is the center for medical device research, you're 10 times more likely to produce a medical devices pattern. So where you're born, and which is clearly what you're exposed to in that environment, is hugely important. And this research then shows that there are millions and millions of children who have the exact same maths and science skills as those kids who got the patents, who happened to be born into the right family or in the right place, and who had exactly the same capabilities, but because they weren't given those opportunities, never had the chance to become inventors. And the conclusion of the paper is that there are millions and millions of what they call hidden Einsteins throughout the country, uh, which if, they ha if that potential was tapped and they were given those opportunities, you'd have huge increase in innovation and productivity. And I think in every country, in Egypt, there are millions of hidden Einsteins. Those little girls who are in the village who didn't have the chances I had could just as easily had a much better career than me, but they weren't given the opportunity. Thank you very much. I, over the past 100 years, we've seen a um, huge surge in women as leaders on the global level, as presidents, prime ministers, deans, uh, judges. Your experience in this with women leaders in general, could you tell us something about it? Sure. So when I started my career, there were very few. Uh, I can still remember when I was at the World Bank, there were just a couple of women at senior roles, and they had, uh, they tended to be, um, okay, they tended not to ever marry and never have children, and they had to really sacrifice a huge amount to succeed in their careers. And thankfully, that has changed, and we're in a very different era. In fact, today, for the first time in human history, there are more women graduating from university globally than men which is extraordinary, and that is a worldwide phenomenon, including in the Middle East. And I think we are on the cusp of a major change. I think one, one of the issues in a country like Egypt, though, is that there are many, many incredibly talented young Egyptian women, but only 16% of Egyptian women participate in the formal labor market. And if you could equalize male and female labor force participation in Egypt, the economy would be 60% bigger. 60% bigger if you could use all that fantastic female talent. Now, obviously, to use that fantastic female talent, you have to have high-quality childcare that's affordable, you have to have families and husbands who are supportive, uh, and you have to have a system, uh, a social security system that makes that, makes that lucrative and profitable. But I think at the moment, uh, we really are on the cusp of potentially a major change, and I'm quite optimistic about not just all the women we see rising to the top, but also all the young women coming up who will fill those jobs in the future. Towards, towards gender parity? Why not? <laughs> Another important theme that you touched upon was education. What, in your opinion, are the key um, changes you see in education, and how could universities you know, affect social mobility? So, higher education is, is at, in a period of great change. Um, demand for higher education in many countries is on the rise because it is clearly a, a, a determinant of professional success. Um, but the nature of what's required is being, is being transformed by technology. We know that many routine jobs will be automated going forward. Jobs like driving a truck. Uh, although I'm not sure in Cairo traffic you could have a robot driving a truck, but it will come someday. <laughs> um, but, but many routine jobs will be automated. And I think also this generation 
you know, frankly, teaching them to memorize anything is a waste of time when they can get the answer to any factual question on a search engine within seconds. And so it's the ability to analyze data, to be critical about it, to make an argument, to use soft skills like emotional intelligence, being able to work in teams, being creative, being entrepreneurial. Those are the things that I think will determine professional success in the longer term. And I think universities are just at the beginning of grappling with teaching those kind of skills rather than the more traditional skills. Thank you. And finally, I won't abuse the time of the audience, but um, you've seen a lot of global leaders in your career, whether at the World Bank, whether at DFID, whether at the IMF, and probably now at LSE, you host quite a few leaders. How do you think, in your opinion, do they um, manage uncertainties, or how do they face risk or expect, uh, how do they deal with un uncertain outcomes of their decisions? I mean, I think uh, a, a huge amount of leadership is coping with uncertainty. And I think there are, there are two key elements to, to coping. One is being very prepared, and the second is being very flexible. So I'll give you an example. When I was at the Bank of England, um, I had the pleasure of having to do contingency planning for two referenda, one the Scottish referendum and two the original Brexit referendum. And we did huge amounts of contingency planning for every eventuality in terms of what might happen to sterling, what might happen to the banks, what might happen to the financial system. Uh, we thought of every single thing that could go wrong, and we rehearsed, literally rehearsed. We made sure that all the systems were going to work, that the, pi that the pipes in the financial system were clear. We ran tests. Uh, we ran uh, scenarios. Um, we made sure that the financial system was prepared and could cope with a whole range of shocks, and we made them run tests and scenarios and, and contingency planning. And so I, there's something about that huge degree of preparation that is... Uh, it, when you face the crisis, you're very calm. So I remember going into the, uh, I, I ran the trading room at the Bank of England, and I remember walking into the trading room at four in the morning, the morning after the Brexit referendum. Uh, and the screens were all, and I, all on, and I just watched the sterling markets, collect, you know, sterling fall by 20% in the markets, just watching it go down. But it was orderly and stable, and we were completely prepared if anything went wrong. And having done all that homework, Made, made me very calm. Now, of course, as the famous military historian Clausewitz said, every plan collapses with first contact with the enemy. So no matter how much you've prepared, it won't be exactly as you've planned, and you have to be flexible and adjust. And so things happen, and you have to, you have to be able to respond. But I think that combination of preparation and flexibility is the only way to keep your head cool in a crisis. Thank you. Are you ready now to face the uncertain questions of the, <laughs> of the audience? The floor is open. Um, we will take uh, three questions at a time uh, before Minouche uh, can answer. Please raise your voice and introduce yourself. Dr. Zainab Chauki Younes, and um, it's been an honor to be here tonight and to listen to all these uh, wonderful talks about um, leadership and global leadership. I have a question for you. Uh, actually, um, I am um, an associate professor at the British University in Egypt, but this is my home university, actually, and I'm directing the Research Center for Innovation. So usually I tell my student a famous question about where, whether leadership is born or made. And we always fall into the riddle, and I always go with the idea of leadership being born in a global context, but then they come up with another question in a culturally diplomatic way. Uh, whenever disruptions happen and whenever, whenever globalization happens, you need this kind of exponential leadership where you have to face um, any crisis. So what do you think? Would we prepare ourselves or just look for a real born on the floor leader to lead the way? Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Handusa. I 
very much like to hear from Minouche what the prospects are for women to take the lead in terms of reducing the workload for women, discriminating in their favor to have a six hour day. I've introduced this in the South and it's working very well. I wonder where we, why we keep being told to worry about digitalization and robotics, etc., when all we want in our culture down in Egypt is to reduce the load on the woman so that she can do all what she wants at home with her children and family alongside working. Thank you. And a third question here, the gentleman. Denisov. I have a question about, or two questions. Could you introduce okay. yourself, please? My name is Ahmed Abdurrahman. I was alum here from AUC, and I'm doing my PhD in economics at University of Chicago. I have the main question that how we reduce the gap between the main street and the Wall Street, and the second, maybe at your current role, between LSE and the main street, between academia and the main street again, because I feel both of them have huge gaps to get. Okay, those are, thank you, Kareem, for those, you know, finding me those very difficult questions. <laughs> So let me start with the leadership. Is it born or do we, you know, do we need to keep looking for our saviors? I mean, I, so much of history is about this debate about is history made by great leaders or is it structural forces that, that drive history? And I guess I'm, I tend to believe more in big structural forces, but I think great leaders find those opportunities. I mean, when I've seen countries implement really dramatic reforms that really change them. It tends to be the convergence of two things, which is some, some structural shift happens where there's some crisis or some huge pressure that the country has to respond to. And then some very clever leader uses that window of opportunity to drive change. And I think it's that combination that really uh, tends to be the biggest driver of success uh, in, 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 most, in most situations. Of course, there are moments in history when there's some great leader who takes people like Mandela to a place where they didn't want to go. Um, but, but by and large, I think that's the more normal path. Hiba, my lovely Hiba, who was my teacher and inspiration when I was at the AUC and for many years after. Of course, I agree with you. <laughs> I think, you, I think you put your finger on a very good point. Today, not to. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing magical about the 40-hour work week. If you look in history, if you go back to the sort of 18th, 19th century, the average working hours for people was about 75 hours. And then over the course of history, the normal hours worked has declined steadily until we got to the current norm, which we think of as 35 to 40 hours a week. But there's nothing magical about that. And the truth is, one of the res really resp real responses to automation is to reduce the number of working hours and to make part-time work a much more normal part of life. If you look at what robots can do, robots can do autom sort of re repeat and repetitive and routine jobs. And if you're really interested, you can go to the BBC website and you can type in your job and it gives you the probability that you'll be replaced by a robot. Uh, and there are some jobs where the risk of automation is extremely high, like driving a truck or even being an accountant. But there are other jobs, thankfully, like being a university professor, in which the risk of automation is very low. <laughs> or even things like being a manicurist. Very hard to automate being a manicurist. But the point is, what ro robots can usually only do parts of jobs. They can do, in, you know, in food service, you can order your, what you want to order on an iPad, but the actual food preparation, it will take a while before a robot can do that. And so if parts of jobs can be automated, then the other part can be done by a human in fewer hours. And I think particularly as you imply for women, 
there's a huge opportunity. But labor market policies also need to change. So part-time work needs to be made more normal. Benefits need to be pro rata with hours. And people need to be able to do part-time job and carry their benefits with them, so social security and other protections for labor. But I do think that making part-time work easier will be good, especially for women, but also for men. And it's a hugely important part of the response to growing automation. And then the third question was a uh, very difficult question, Main Street and Wall Street. Um, this was a huge debate in the wake of the financial crisis, was there was a feeling that the bailouts that happened were to the benefit of Wall Street, to the banks, and at the expense of Main Street, ordinary people. Um, and I think part of the backlash that we see in many countries today, in many of the advanced economies, reflects that that balance wasn't quite right. Uh, I think banks and bank shareholders and bank bondholders didn't carry enough of the burden of the bailouts. At the time, there wasn't a very clear legal framework for doing that. That's now much clearer and much more in place with, I won't get very technical, but total loss absorbing capacity, TLAC, and other med reforms that have been put in place such that in future, if banks fail, the burden will be borne by the shareholders and the bondholders and not by taxpayers. So I think going forward, we're in a better place, but there's no doubt that the balance was not right during the financial crisis. And then between LSE and Main Street, it's a very good question. I think universities have a hugely important role to play in societies today, especially in an era of fake news, anti-expert, and anti-intellectual sentiment. And I think universities have a big responsibility to be open, providing places where genuine debate based on evidence and rigor happens. We do a huge amount of that at the LSE. We have 350 public events every year where we bring world leaders, leading academics, Nobel laureates, and everything is open to the public. And we also put everything on podcast. And so we have about 13 million people who download our podcasts every year from all over the world in order to engage and learn about the big issues of the day. And I think it's more important than ever that universities do that. Shall we take another round of questions? The gentleman in the third row. Thank you, Inush, for a very stimulating lecture. Tariq Khalil. How would you set priorities in view of the limited resources and the huge amounts of problems that may exist? Do you have a formula for that? Thank you. The lady. Could you provide a microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, doctor, uh, it's an honor to be with you today. My name is Wale. Uh, I'm a banker at the National Bank of Egypt, uh, and I'm from Aswan. Uh, so yes, I came a very long way. Um, I would like to have your advice for young women and ladies um, who are facing gender discrimination, especially in work environments, and especially with the culture here in Egypt, and especially in Upper Egypt, that, you know, girls or women cannot uh, have big opportunities in, um, in comparison with other gender people. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman uh, in the aisle. Uh, hello, you have honored us uh, all over the world. Uh, my name is Osama Basusi. I'm translator and management consultant. It's about, uh, my question will be about opportunities in a somewhat uh, dreaming light world. Uh, under what circumstances here in Egypt could we dare to ask you, would you ever be comfortable to come back home to work? I hope this is not very embarrassing. Thank you very much. Okay. So setting priorities, it's, um, you know, that's a very big and difficult question. I think 
every country will make a different set of choices about its priorities. And so I think it's a deeply local question. Uh, some countries, say the United States, which you know well, Tarek, has, has uh, a very different view about what the social contract is. Uh, a highly individualistic, you're sort of on your own, uh, and you have to, you can't really rely, the state will give you basic education, but then after that, if you want to go to university, you take a loan, if you want to, if you fall on hard times, you get unemployment for a short amount of time, but then you're kicked off. Very different model. And that's a social choice. There are other countries, Scandinavia, other end of the spectrum, high rates of taxation, high rates of public support if you fall out of work, big expenditure on education and training. Very different model. So I, I would have to argue that there is no magic formula. I think it's, I think there's, it's a very values-driven set of choices. I think if you look at the literature on returns to public investment, where should the state invest its money in terms of priorities, it tends to be that there are incredibly high returns to early years and basic education, and then followed by secondary. Uh, I think higher education is more complicated because it has a public good quality and a private good quality. So I would support a mixed model for funding higher education because people benefit by earning higher wages, uh, but they also are better citizens, they're more healthy, they do other things that, that, that provide public good. Um, and then I guess the other area I would point to is infrastructure, but again, you have to choose very carefully which infrastructure you invest in, and again, it's very locally driven. Gender discrimination. Um, you know, that's a very uh, a tough question. I, I guess what I'd say from my own experience is that um, things will get better. <laughs> they will get better in time. You may not feel it now, but they will get better in time. If you find yourself personally in a situation where you have serious discrimination, it's hard as an individual to change a whole organization when you're still young and junior. Sometimes it's best to go somewhere else where your talents will be better appreciated, if that's possible. Uh, sometimes it's good to team up with others. So I have seen situations where lots of young women get together and raise an issue at an institutional level and multiple voices is more powerful than one voice. Um, and yeah, and I think in some organizations, having male allies is really important. So you can find some men, often men with daughters, uh, who will have seen their daughters grow up and know how talented their daughters are. Um, someone I know in, in the UK uh, created a charity called the 30% Club, where she wanted to get 30% of all the boards of all the companies in the UK to have women on it, of the leading, the FTSE 100, the top companies. And she targeted the chairman of the boards of companies who had daughters, which was very smart. And she met her target because they were incredibly empathetic. And once she said to them, would you like your daughter to be discriminated against in this way? That really got to them. So that's also a good, a good strategy. Uh, and me, well, I have a job at the moment that I've just started, so I need to, I need to stick to it and deliver, uh, deliver on that for the moment. But, you know, one never knows where life takes you. Thank you. Let's take one last round of questions. The young gentleman on the aisle. Dave Milus. Thank you so much for coming here in Cairo. My name is Karim. I study at Cairo University. So my question for you is pretty much so, sort of simple. It seems like you, if any skill that you would have to be a global economist, it would be that you're intensely focused. But what I fear most is that sometimes with, that, with, with, with such complicated and, and strong skill and ability to focus, Sometimes you lose a grasp or a sort of, you don't quite predict what's going on the parallel lines in the economy. So for instance, with cryptocurrencies and, and so many changes, 
and happening in the economy. We don't know if, if our economy in 20 years is going to, to be on a different road or, or, or actually are we well equipped or, or are we preparing ourselves to, to, such, to things that we particularly don't see. There is a strange factor in this equation with cryptocurrencies and I don't think that our economy or the, what we study in college actually equip us as students to, to know what, what, what sort of uh, uh, digitalization and the impact in, in the economy, especially in Egypt, in, in a developing country, where we actually, we're, we're, we're in 2019 and we're striving to see uh, education going to, to underdeveloped people and, and resources going to under marginalized segments. So, do you see this in your position? And your new career. Thank you. Thank you. The lady in the aisle over there. My name is Ed Amir. I graduated from the Faculty of Economics and Political Science at Cairo University. And currently I'm working in the development sector in Egypt. So my question is, now in a lot of different countries, we have the fourth industrial revolution. We have the fourth industrial revolution, yet somehow developing countries are lagging behind. Now I want to know, is there a possibility that the fourth industrial revolution would actually change international cooperation? I mean, it won't be based on aid, maybe it would be based more on technology transfer or, ser or transferring services. So this is my first question. Um, the second question is very short, but in order to be, let's say, more equipped to work in the field of international development, what fields or masters are, would be more demanded in the future? This is a paying question. <laughs> the gentleman. Is... Um, I am Mustafa Kamil Said. I teach political science at Cairo University and at the American University of Cairo. And I had the honor of sharing a conference with you at School of uh, Oriental and African Studies many years ago in London. Uh, my, I imagine a situation in which Mrs. Theresa May, uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, would ask the director of LSE to give advice. How could Britain deal with Brexit? What would you say to her? <laughs> They're so easy, these questions. It's really... Uh, <laughs> okay, so let me start with um, the question on crypto and kind of changes to the economy. I mean, I think... What would I say? I think you need always to be open to big shocks and changes that might transform the economy. Uh, and often, frankly, young people are more open to some of these ideas. When I was at the IMF and we used to do something called the early warning exercise where we would try and anticipate where the next financial crisis was going to be, um, we would have a, you know, a core team who would analyze every country in the world's balance of payments and fiscal and see how each economy was doing and try and figure out which economies were the most vulnerable. But we started to often have what we called a red team, which was a group that worked in parallel, often consisting of younger economists and we would give them a mandate of, you guys think out of the box. These guys are gonna look at the data and try and analyze it in the conventional way, but you have a mandate to be much more creative and wacky and think about what happens if there's a meteorite that strikes Russia, what do we do, you know? And sort of, so I think often giving some people the space to think more laterally and telling them that that's their job is a very good way to make sure that you get that perspective when you're having to make big decisions. Having said that, I think crypto is a lot of hype. <laughs> I think cryptocurrencies are a speculative asset. They are not a currency. They are not a store of value. Uh, I think they are like black tulips in the 17th century. And, uh, and I don't think they have the characteristics of a currency. They're not used for transactions. They're not used as a store of value. And so I think one of the other things you get with experience is you start to know what's hype and what's real. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, um, you know, digital currency, that's different. It'll probably done by, be by central banks. 
and as soon as any digital currency starts to become significant for transactions purposes, central banks will just replace them. Uh, so I, I, have, I have some skepticism about, about the importance of cryptocurrencies as a, as a really serious economic phenomenon. It's, just, it's also, frankly, just not macroeconomically significant. That's, I remember the first time I got a press question when I was at the IMF on cryptocurrencies, and I asked the staff at the IMF, so what are we going to say about crypto? They just said, it's not macroeconomically significant. That's the answer. <laughs> it's true. Um, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so the fourth industrial revolution is the idea that we're going into this digital economy and it's going to change uh, the structure of our economies fundamentally. Um, and I think that is true. Um, I think the phenomenon of automation and robotics and machine learning is transforming not just manufacturing, but many services as well. I think it will mean that many, many parts of manufacturing which through global supply chains have now moved out of the advanced economies are going to move back into the advanced economies because if you can run a factory in Germany that produces chemicals with one man in front of four screens and almost and really no people, which is now technologically possible, uh, the cost of labor is no longer going to be the determinant of where a factory locates. And so it is changing the calculus of, of, of where where firms locate. Um, I also think it will change, for many countries, the traditional path of development. So in the past, the model was you were predominantly agricultural, then you developed industry, and then as you became an advanced economy, most of your economy was services. I think that manufacturing stage will become truncated for many countries, uh, and services will become a much, much more important part of most economies very quickly as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. And what to study? Well, <laughs> I would say economics, wouldn't I? But, um, <laughs> um, you know, I think international development now has become a much wider field, though. Traditionally, economics was the way into it. But there are also important roles for people who do social policy, who do anthropology, who do politics, uh, who understand data. And I guess the one thing I'd say is a really important thing, no matter what subject you study, is study data sciences. Understand how to use data, understand how to use big data, data visualization. That will be critical no matter what subject you're studying going forward. Uh, and then finally, Brexit. <laughs> oh, I came all the way to Cairo to be able to stop talking about Brexit. <laughs> I can't escape. Um, what would I say? I guess what I'd say is that Brexit is a symptom of much deeper economic problems in the UK. And it's a symptom of economic problems that relate to declining social mobility and regional economic inequality and issues around identity. And leaving the European Union will not solve any of those problems. And I fear that Brexit is a bit of a distraction to dealing with those fundamental issues. Uh, and I wish that political energy would be focused on dealing with those issues, like infrastructure in declining regions, like providing better vocational training opportunities for people to prepare for the new labor market, um, and so I guess my advice would be focus on the really important structural drivers behind, underlying Brexit rather than these fairly um, arcane issues of uh, the treaty renegotiation with Europe. Thank you very much. Let's give a huge applause to Minou Shafiq. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ambassador and Demanouche. What a wonderful presentation. We all uh, 
enjoyed it very much and learned a lot and stimulated more thinking about the future. I'd like to now invite uh, Mr. Fouad Yunus and Ms. Uh, Nahid Yunus uh, on behalf of the rest of the clan that is here for us to provide a simple thank you and also Dan Manoush if you would join us as well. We'll do a photograph and we would like to give a very small uh, token of our appreciation for your uh, being with us this evening. <laughs> 